Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. Our goal today is to take the, f the first important step toward mastery of protein tertiary and quaternary structure. Remember that we talked earlier about primary, secondary structure. Today we're going to talk about tertiary and quaternary structure, the next hierarchical levels of structure. Let me orient you a little bit. Remember that we're talking about protein structure here. Proteins are polymers of amino acids, of course, and those polymers of amino acids will fold up in a sequence-specific fashion, about which we'll see a great deal more today and in our next segment. They fold up in little local domains, that, that uh, including things like alpha helices and, uh, and uh, beta uh, chains that we talked about last time, and then those secondary structures uh, fold further, intimately associating to form what we call tertiary structure. We're going to look at that today today, having looked at secondary structure previously. Moreover, once a globular protein folds up this way, let's actually now code the entire protein with a single color so we can tell it from another protein. So let's make this one red. It has a particular tertiary structure. Suppose you have a second protein coded here in blue that has its own tertiary structure, and they then form a specific bond, uh, non-covalent bond with one another. They associate with one another. That's what's called quaternary structure. It's the association of multiple globular elements or other kinds of elements that are then uh, associated non-covalently with one another, not the two pieces not being encoded by the same genes. Let's introduce a couple of pieces of terminology that will be useful to us later. If you have a, 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 a two proteins associated in this way, each of the proteins is called a protomer, not a monomer, for example. We save that for the individual amino acids, for example, in this case. So this would be called a protomer, and when you put them together, it's a, it's a multimer of some sort. This is a tumor, so this would be called a dimer. And there are two different types of protomers in this dimer, so it is a heterodimer. Some proteins are designed to associate with other copies of themselves, as diagrammed here, and when that happens, we call it a homodimer. And we can extend this terminology to uh, heterotetramers and heterohexamers or homohexamers and so on and so forth in the ways that you might imagine. Okay, so today we're going to focus on secondary and quaternary structure, what it looks like, what its internal stabilizing structures are. So let's start with the basic, uh, um, the basics of structures. Let me remind you of how secondary structure then transitions into tertiary and quaternary structure. So this is the alpha helix, a secondary structural element that we talked about at great length in our last uh, uh, theory video. And remember that it's often symbolized either as a ribbon or as a cylinder, as indicated here. These are beta chains, which form beta sheets, or beta propellers, or beta barrels, as they're sometimes called, beta pleated sheets. And then we symbolize those in more complex structures with arrows running N to C, amino to carboxy. So the top is a parallel a beta uh, a sheet, and the bottom is an anti-parallel beta sheet where the two change point in opposite directions. These are secondary structural elements. Well, let's now look at how the secondary structural elements get put together into tertiary structure. So here are three tertiary structures, and it's worthwhile taking a few minutes to actually look at them. Let's start with the leftmost one first. Notice that each of these uh, is a pair. So at left, you see at top a ribbon diagram of, the, of a protein that has lots of alpha helices in it. So you'll notice the helical segments, each connected with a little uh, non-standard loop, a little... Uh, um, um, loop that's not alpha helix or not um, beta chain, sometimes called a connector. And notice at the bottom, there's a slightly more simplified version of the, of the diagram that makes it easier to see the flow of the peptide from its amino terminus to its carboxy terminus through the protein. So this left-hand case is comparatively simple to understand. Let's go to the middle case now, case B here. And at the top is the, is the more uh, detailed ribbon diagram. You'll see the beta chains N to C coursing through the structure and their relationships to one another, making a kind of distorted anti-parallel uh, beta sheet here. Now look at the bottom and notice the path of the polypeptide chain through this tertiary structure. It's a little complicated. You have a, an anti-parallel loop, an anti-parallel beta sheet loop, and then there's a long connector and the, the the, the next anti-parallel segment is elsewhere, and then you loop around and make another uh, anti-parallel segment. So notice that you get this rather complex anti-parallel uh, beta sheet out of a rather torturous uh, primary sequence, amino acid sequence pathway through the protein. That's not uncommon. Globular proteins often have rather complex uh, primary sequence paths through their folded structure. The structure at the right, then, rightmost, is a little more complex than the other two, and it's a mixture of both 
beta chains and alpha helices. And again, you can see the ribbon diagram at the top and then the simplified diagram at the bottom. Again, notice how complicated the, the primary sequence polypeptide path is through the secondary structural elements and then this complicated way in which the secondary structural elements fold up to create the tertiary structure of these three proteins. So it doesn't hurt to actually pause the image here and study these frames, get comfortable with them. These are two sets of ways of representing secondary structures, which we're going to use not only today, but repeatedly coming back uh, as we go through the rest of the course. Here is now a more uh, a compl slightly more complicated protein. This represents something you often see. This is a multi-domain protein and its tertiary structure. You'll notice here that the, the beta chains are arrows, the connectors are thin lines, and the alpha helices are, are, are cylinders. Very easy to, to see. But notice that there are two sort of distinct pieces of this protein. They're color-coded here to make it easier to see. This is actually a dehydrogenase. Details need not concern us. This is a class of enzymes that we'll look at a lot later in our journey when we're looking at metabolism, how we uh, take in food molecules and use them for energy or to generate building blocks for larger molecules. The top part of this molecule actually grabs the substrate that's going to be oxidized. This uh, enzyme will catalyze an oxidation reduction reaction. Again, much more about that later. And then the bottom red segment, you'll notice a little extra structure besides the amino acid, the polypeptide backbone diagram there. That is a, a NAD, as it's called, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It is a cofactor that's going to accept the reducing potential from the oxidized substrate grabbed by the top part of the molecule. So the two domains of this globular protein, its tertiary structure, have separate functions and they interact in order to execute their functions. This illustrates a slightly more complex tertiary structure. There are even more complex tertiary structures than this where you have a larger protein that might have two, three, four, even five domains is not uh, completely unheard of. And those domains typically have uh, somewhat different functions. Again, remember, our, our real interest in all of these structural details is because they're going to help us understand how the molecular machines, the catalysts, all the different things that make biochemistry possible, the biochemistry of an organism like you or me, uh, how those actually work. So as we go through the rest of our journey here today, notice that these tertiary structures involve very specific placements, not just of the polypeptide chains diagrammed here, but of individual amino acid side chains. So you're creating environments in which there are specific amino acids side chains that are positioned very precisely with respect to one another. And as we come in a couple of uh, more segments later to how enzyme catalysis works, how protein machines work, you'll see that those juxtaposition of very specific amino acids in very specific ways are crucial to understanding the mechanics, the machinery of executing these biochemical tasks. Today our goal is to understand how that machinery gets built, how, how these, these particular little local environments idiosyncratic to the individual proteins and specific catalysts, for example, come into existence. So let's look at the energetics, the thermodynamics of quaternary structure. Remember that everything that's possible in the world is possible because it makes thermodynamic sense, it makes energetic sense, as we've talked about at length already. So remember, this is a diagram of our folded protein, and this is a highly simplified version of something that we're going to enrich with more detail today. You'll notice the middle part here is, is green. We call it, in this case, a hydrophobic, hydrophobic buried residues, or sometimes called a hydrophobic core. We're going to talk in more detail in a couple of minutes about exactly what's going on in there. But remember the hydrophobic effects that we talked about at great length in talking about water as a solvent, where, where uh, excluding water from the environment of hydrophobic molecules is entropically extremely favorable. As we'll see, that turns out to be one of the major determinants, that thermodynamic effect, the entropic effect of taking hydrophobic residues and hiding them from the surrounding water is uh, plays a very large role in the folding of proteins. The other half of that is taking hydrophilic residues, charged residues, highly uh, uh, polar residues, and exposing them, as diagrammed here, to the water. So in fact, when you we're, we'll be talking about proteins as if we're looking at them in isolation. But never forget that we are absolutely not. Proteins fold in water, in an aqueous environment. And I'll keep calling your attention back to that as we look at their secondary structure, their tertiary and quaternary structures today. And in our next segment, as we look at the dynamics of folding of these structures, Water, the interaction of side chains with water will be central to everything that we do. All right, so let's zero in and look at some of the details here. So what's diagrammed on this slide is a, a polypeptide chain that's coursing around the, the screen in ways that we really not, don't need to be concerned with here. What I really want to call your attention to is the two phenylalanine residues and their um, benzene ring systems. They're the